to episode 124 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 10th of May, 2021. I'm Joe, and with me are Fainan. Story. <laughs> Graham. Hello. And Will. Hello. I think one of you is supposed to say bro or something. I don't know. Anyway, let's get on with some news. The first one is that Audacity has been acquired by MuseScore. And that's excellent news because they're going to pump some resources into it, add some features, and make it great. And then, oh, hang on, no. The first change that happened was a pull request to add telemetry using Google Analytics and Yandex. So, hmm, not a good start. To be fair, these are opt-in. They are off by default. And, you know, I, I can kind of see where they're coming from. They've made an investment into a project and they want to better understand what people are doing with it, how they're using it, so that they can focus their energy on development. I'm sure that it's not quite as straightforward as that, but I also am sure that it's not tinfoil hat time. Remind us, whose idea was it to add something similar to Ubuntu? Will? Um, I don't know. Wimpress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blame it on him now, he's gone. No, that is a fair point, that as long as it is opt-in, although my understanding from looking through the pull request is that it is going to be, during the installation on Windows, like a radio button or whatever, that you will have to change over or might have to change over. I'm not sure about that yet. It's not 100% clear whether this will even end up in the final version of it, but it's certainly going to be easy to opt out of it, if not completely opt in. And so, yeah, you you can see why they would want to gather some data, but maybe not using Google and Yandex for that. And also not the first thing that happens after you announce you've been acquired. That was a bad timing, I think. Well, how the whole announcement was handled was a bit weird. It came in the form of a YouTube video by Martin Keary, who goes by Tanta Crawl, I think, on YouTube, where the title of it is, I'm now in charge of Audacity, seriously. And the thumbnail is, I just joined Audacity. And apparently he's a relatively well-known personality on YouTube. And that's how it was announced. And then the official announcement came shortly after that on Audacity's website, which just basically linked to the video and said, we're scared and excited. We hope you are too. Did they get the same PR firm that did Red Hat sent us stream announcement or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel a little bit tinfoil hatty about this. And even though there's nothing exactly similar, it reminds me a bit of how SourceForge subverted um, FileZilla. Because Audacity is a hugely important application that's probably, even though I've criticized it, um, quite a lot. It's 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 used by everybody. It's a really important link in the audio chain for loads of people that wouldn't be able to afford an editor otherwise. So it's really important, and probably the developers got very little love, um, just criticism from people like me. Um, maybe they're happy to re be rid of it, but it represents such a great opportunity for somebody to come in and put in analytics like this, and to maybe not make the focus improving the application in the way that it should be. And maybe just look at, you know, seeing what kind of data they can get out of it. Because a lot of these people will be using it in semi-pro situations. And there, there still seems to be a lot of money in the audio software business on, in proprietary land. Yeah, I mean, I think the the next step up is, well, essentially Ardor, isn't it? I mean, you, there's not really... There's nothing, yeah. There's yeah. nothing like it. Nothing for simple editing, you know, as, as Joe will agree with. Well, yeah, when you started talking there, it reminded me, oh, shit quickly check that it's recording and sure enough i'm now staring at the waveform of this appearing in audacity we all use it to record the show it is an invaluable part of podcasting for a lot of people it's something i know that if i'm doing an interview with someone i'll record it my end but i'll also ask them to record it their end using audacity because i know no matter whether on a mac windows or linux audacity will be available and free and will be basically the same yeah it might be ugly but it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? You open it, you press record, you save it, you export it. You can do a lot more with it if you want to, but it is also potentially very simple for most people to use. And so if this does go to shit, then it's not good. But then it's open source, isn't it? Someone can fork it. And a lot of the public comments I saw were actually saying, look, this is the open source model working as it should. This is why it's so much better than proprietary software, because people spotted this change. You know, people could argue about it in the pull request and it has, you know, eyes on it. Um, so that's another positive as well. 
Yeah, and people can influence it as well. Even if it still happens and telemetry is added, it will be opt-in and it will also probably not be using Google, which otherwise it may have done. If it was a proprietary bit of software, we would have just had no clue. It's such a strange choice, the two of them. Because, I mean, I don't think there's any opposition really to to helping developers out. If you can actually help them out with telemetry, like I use the KDE stuff for various applications and Plasma itself, I don't mind doing that, but I would mind sending it off to Google to parse through. But, I mean, I think the features that they do want to improve, if if that's actually going to materialize, I don't know, to improve the look of it and to make a decent plug-in system to tie in with the various uh, free and open source ones and probably paid as well. These sound promising. Wasn't that what you were going on about, Graham, about like non-destructive? Yeah, it could do so much more. I mean, that's the thing. That was the point I was trying to make a few episodes ago. Um, where I I know that you, d- you don't feel the need for it, but I think it's because maybe we use it for different things. Um, and there is really nothing to bridge the gap between this and, and like Pro Tools or Arda. There's nothing that's kind of still editing an audio file with a little bit more flexibility, like you would use layers in the GIMP. I think that's the closest I can kind of approximate those kind of things to. Yeah, what's the Adobe one? I think that does sit in that gap, is it? Audition. Audition, yeah. Yeah. But obviously that's proprietary and paid for. There really is very little. And, you know, I remember the where, the audio wear scene back in proprietary land days and everybody would use WaveLab or oh, what was the one that was? Um, SoundForge. SoundForge, yeah. And SoundForge, which was, I think, in the end bought by Sony. Mm, yeah. So I really do think there's a, a huge opportunity for an application a little bit more ambitious than Audacity has been for the last few years. But I'm not criticizing the developers for their lack of work. Well, something that was pointed out in an article that I read about this was in that initial announcement video, they got quite a few of the devs to talk about it. And something that was pretty common amongst them was that they were all pretty grey and, you know, getting on a bit, which, you know, I'm sure we all are, but it could do with some new blood, couldn't it? And maybe this might be a way to do that. That certainly explains the user interface using GTK2 or whatever it was. No, no, it wasn't, was it? (laughs) WX widgets. WX widgets, yeah, that's it. I mean, the great thing about that is you can run it off a USB stick with libraries from 15-year-old Linux distributions. And Windows 95, probably. (laughs) Yeah, which actually is a good thing um, for something like this. But people have argued for a long time that it needs modernization and therefore it needs investment and therefore it needs a company to come along and do something like this. Yeah, so this tentacle is also responsible for MuseScore. And I also found it quite an arrogant video. I think you've kind of alluded to that a little bit. Um, I'm now in charge of Audacity. But also MuseScore I've used. Now, I don't read music, but I have needed to transcribe things for a few a, a few people. And MuseScore um, is a not- piece of notation software, kind of similar to um, Audacity in that it there's a famous commercial application called Sibelius that everybody tries to compete with and it allows people to do the same kind of thing for free with music notation but the UI is horrendous Um, it's really complicated it's overburdened with a million menu options and it's difficult to use now I don't read music so maybe I'm misreading it but it doesn't fill me with a whole amount of confidence that they'll be able to make the right decisions for audacity well, something you pointed out in the video was the number of magnifying glasses. Like, I'm looking at it now. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, he was joking about adding some more of those. I mean, it is, it's it's not the greatest interface in the world, is it? I do, even now, sometimes have stuff happen. I'm not even joking, that I can't fix. I just use a backup of my dot directory to get it back to <laughs> what it was. Because I have no idea what the fuck I did. I'm sure that I could read documentation or whatever, but it's just quick as a restore from a backup. So they can't make it any worse, can they? Because we've got that code base there that could be forked off and renamed and changed the trademarks or whatever. It, it's not exactly real, is it, in terms of the effort that would be required, you would think, or you'd hope. So I remain cautiously optimistic, even after this telemetry thing. Like I think that hopefully that will teach them hang on, we can't fuck with this too badly, otherwise there's going to be a lot of backlash. Yeah, I agree. And I can't really remember the last time I upgraded Audacity because of a new feature. I got upgraded just because I've, you know, changed my distro and it's just happened naturally. I can't think of anything that's changed in it in the last 10 years. 
that I, would mean that I couldn't go back to a previous version and just use that instead. Is there an open source kind of open telemetry system? Because I wouldn't feel half as bad um, giving telemetry data if I got something out of it, if I could view everybody else's telemetry data or at least like... Um, Obviously, an anonymized version, but I can I can actually read. I mean, it'd be really interesting, for example, to see what the KDE team gets or the Plasma team, or what Audacity gets, even if some of it has to be omitted. I'd, I'd be much more invested in the process of sending telemetry data if I could say, "Oh, look at that! There's loads of people using the same color scheme as me, or whatever." But anonymizing that data is incredibly hard. Like properly anonymizing it, as you know, will right when you had that with the Ubuntu desktop situation like it is very hard to not have very clever people take that data and work out who's who from it yeah you're right it, it can be very very tricky now when we were doing the ubuntu stuff we were very careful not to gather anything that we thought was personally identifying even so it was extremely difficult and we were extremely careful about how that information was aggregated to try and make sure that people couldn't unpick it again um, and there was a classic story I, I can't remember where this happened now but a classic story of there were a very few people in one particular geographical region and that geographical region was quite unique and so you could fairly easily work out exactly who those few people were um you know just because there are so few of them uh, and stuff like that that you just you don't think will be a problem but then is a problem uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history there. Was that the Isle of Man? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux to get started with $100 free credit and 60 days to use it. Linode offers cloud computing solutions in data centers all over the world. Whether it's scalable VMs with the choice of major distros or one-click apps and stacks, dedicated CPU and high RAM instances, block and object storage, or cloud firewalls and DDoS protection, Linode has everything you need for your personal projects right up to managed enterprise infrastructure. I recently moved our website over to Linode and it was really straightforward. And when I needed a mumble server for our community meetups, spinning up a new VM for that was an absolute breeze. Everything's been running flawlessly since I set it up and I love the peace of mind I get from the automatic backups. So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, get your $100 credit, and check out Linode's great cloud hosting services and first-class, always available support. That's linode.com slash late-night-linux. Well, some good news. Elementary OS 6 beta is available. This has been a long time coming. They've been dogged with delays, but the beta is finally here for anyone to download and check out. I think the biggest thing is that they've switched the App Center backend to Flatpak now, and that was obviously quite a lot of work to do. And there's a, a detailed blog post by Cassidy, as usual. So we'll link to that and have a read of it and uh, check it out and report bugs and hopefully they can get this release out. And fully enough, uh, Nicolo Vey, who we've featured before with many videos and things, he actually did a review of Elementary OS 6, uh, which is well worth a watch if you, you want to have a, a sneak peek of various features, which we should link to as well, I think. Yeah, he does these KDE developers' perspective on other distros or whatever videos. He does, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll put a link to Cassidy's post and the uh, YouTube video in the notes then. And somewhat related is Linux App Summit 2021, which is happening this week. Yeah, it starts on Thursday. And uh, yeah, there's uh, three or four days of a uh, combination of both KDE and GNOME. And I think there's even some Windows stuff in there as well. So well worth a watch and try and get involved if you can. All right, well, there'll be a link to the schedule in the show notes then. Check it out. On to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to learn more about that, latenightlinux.com slash support. And remember, for $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And thank you to everyone who's been coming to the community meetups on Mumble. The next one of those will be on Friday, the 21st of May at 10 p.m. UK time. It looks like we're going to just stick to every other Friday. Details at latenightlinux.com slash mumble. And check out Late Night Linux Extra 21. That was released yesterday as we record. And uh, we were talking about free software only phones and how practical they are. And uh, if you want to get in contact with us, latenightlinux.com slash contact. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets. 
training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills, go to cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux and sign up for a seven day free trial. The on-demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts, and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service, available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals, and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven-day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. It's been a relatively slow couple of weeks in terms of news. There's been stuff we could have talked about, but uh, I don't know, it wasn't all that interesting. So I thought we would answer a question that we seem to get quite often, and that is where do we get our news from in the first place, whether that's Linux news, tech news, or news generally. And I'm interested to hear where you guys get yours from. Conspiracy theories off Twitter. (laughs) Well, my answer is going to be a combination, but uh, where where do you get your Linux news from? I know, Will, you seem to post a lot of Slashdot links. Yeah, I've got uh, a few choice websites in my Feedly um, setup. Stuff that I used to have in Google, um, uh, what the hell was it called? Google Reader. Yeah. Oh, those were the days. Um, and it's just, so all of my news feeds date from that sort of era. Um, and the register and slash dot um, still feature on there. I'm not a huge fan of Reddit and things like that. Um, or, and Hacker News is okay, but um, I don't know. There seems to be quite a lot of inactionable news, things that are just there for... Um, either for uh, clickbait or to um, to stoke the fires of um, of arguing, and I just quite like news stories that are about a thing that's happened rather than uh, having opinions about stuff. And I find that, like Slashdot, for example, is just an interesting thing that somebody has already found on the web. It's a sort of semi curated in that manner uh, that the interesting stuff floats to the top, and I still seem to have quite a sort of a lot in common with the stories that naturally appear in that feed. So, yeah, I guess it's a bit legacy, but um, I, I kind of still like Slashdot. How many feeds have you got then, and how frequently do you check them? Do you dip in and out, or do you make sure to read everything? I've probably got, so for in my Linux news subsection, I've probably got uh, five or six, and then I've got more wider tech news, like The Verge and... Um, tech radar and things like that which are quite interesting i don't read all of it the the headline needs to be interesting or the subject needs to be something that i'm interested in and if it's hard to to understand or it's um layered under a whole load of redirect links and stuff like that then i just assume that this must be garbage but if it's got a nice sort of snippet in the whatever it is you get the half page of text that you get in the preview and that sounds interesting then i'll click through to it otherwise i'll just skip over it I don't have a huge amount to add to uh, what Will said, actually. I've just opened up my RSS reader, and I still use this. I've got a counter on my phone, so I can see how many unread messages there are. So I, I generally try and keep on top of it. Um, and so I, I, I use Linux today. I use OMG Ubuntu, um, Pharonix, and um, OS News. And I guess Phelim's going to mention this because he's a paying subscriber, but LWN is excellent. Yeah, very, very cool. But I also find Hacker News... I've followed Hacker News for years and years, and it used to be better than it is now, but I still find it pretty good. Um, I will usually look at the headlines, you know, a few times a day um, just to track what's happening. And I think everything these days has to be taken with a pinch of salt. If there's something interesting, I'll usually try and read up about it from another source or two as well at the same time. But for major events, I don't find much misses Hacker News at some point, even if I don't delve into the comments. I definitely use LWN. The only problem with LWN is I sometimes don't feel I'm intelligent enough to read some of the news <laughs> articles. Uh, mm. But uh, that's more my problem than theirs. But uh, I find, funnily enough, the comments on it can be almost as good as the articles as well because you don't get the usual sort of drivel on there. You get quite intelligent people who know what they're talking about. I mean, yes, there's obviously a bit of sniping now and again, but even that can be quite interesting to read because it usually comes from a place of actual substance as opposed to just, uh, you know, some 14-year-old who's trolling you from his bedroom mm. somewhere. Mm. Um, I, I I do use Reddit for a few things. Like, I was never into Reddit much, but the 
I do find the the Linux and KDE um I don't know what you call them, are they channels? Whatever. Subreddits. Oh, thank you. So I, I find them useful. Like because I had to stop using RSS feed reader because of I couldn't cope with the fact that I had so many unread articles that I just had to keep reading them all and that got to be so crippling that I just had to delete feeds out of it because I can't cope with the fact that I've not read them. So I had to approach it the way I started doing Twitter, which is uh, only use the web front end to it and just check in every now and again. If I've missed stuff, then I've missed stuff and I'm not going back. Unlike you, Joe, because you're compulsive. Well, yeah, I when we first started this show, back when Linux Luddites ended, Paddy gave me his OPML file which was just a lot of different <laughs> subscriptions. And so I put that into a feed reader and I have read every single headline since for the past however many years it's been, three years or whatever at this point. And so on average, it's probably three or 400 headlines a day, not quite so many at the weekend and more when there's like a big Apple event or something. And it's just like just loads and loads of the same thing about new iPad or whatever. But um, yeah, I just skim through them and I let them pile up sometimes and, you know, I I, I get to the end of reading them and then I refresh and I I guess how many there's going to be based on how long it is. And like, I think it's going to be 600 and it's like a thousand. Oh, fuck. (laughs) It's been too many days. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes I just have to set aside a few hours to just read through them all because I, I feel like I have to know what's going on generally. And I've got my Linux section and my tech section and um and an Android one as well, and a BSD one, which nothing really happens in ever. I don't know, I'm still subscribed to those, but just in case anything happens there. Well, there might be a Ghost BSD release or whatever, which is interesting. So Graham's a giant big bastard because he's after posting his unread items from his feeds, and I'm actually starting to sweat looking at all the numbers. <laughs> Bastards. That's actually quite manageable, and there's stuff that I skip. It's not. Oh, God. But, but, this, but Joe just reminded me, I did have a lot more in my OPML file. Um, and like you, Phelan, I never got on top of it. So I really have, maybe like Joe and Twitter, I really have pared down to stuff that I just really care about. I realised, for example, I didn't mention in that security section that Bruce uh, Schneier's blog is really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That's yeah true. I've got that in there, yeah. For tech news as well, I, I still kind of the verge and wired. But for general news, I think this is a real problem because I don't really want to endorse the newspapers that I do read. Um because, well, for example, no, I can't. I'd just be a fucking cliched liberal lefty. <laughs> <laughs> the Guardian can fuck off, by the way. So I, I subscribe to The Guardian. It frustrates me profoundly. I really dislike it. But what else mm. can I do? I think every major news channel is like yeah, that, though. Yeah, that's the problem. It's like, yeah, yeah uh, they always seem to be shoddy and like the typos, the just facts that are completely nonsense. But what I really hate about it is that, especially from The Guardian, I can predict the entire article now from just two or three words (laughs) of the headline. And I can often predict who's written it, Mm -hmm. their race, their gender, and exactly what they're going to conclude with. It sounds to me like you should approach your editor on how to replace all their journalists. (laughs) (laughs) Graham Morrison (laughs) dot AI. Now, this is something I never thought I'd admit as well, but I also read The Financial Times. Now, this this has really come about from my, me being so dissatisfied with The Guardian. But the Financial Times covers news in a really mm. objective way with very little emotional engagement, which I find incredibly refreshing. But the big problem with The Financial Times is it's really expensive, so I don't pay for it. It's like £35 a month or something, so I rely on whatever free tier they provide you. Um, <laughs> I wish there was a more affordable version of The Financial Times. I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier about actionable news. Like the Financial Times and The Economist and and places like that have an article that has done the work for you and, you know, you're left with a very clear insight into what's going on. I find The Guardian will write a story about, you know, some terrible thing that's happening somewhere in the world, but you're just left mm. with uh, this sort of feeling of, well, I'm hopeless. I can't I can't do anything about this. So It's your fault, Will, in fact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if only you'd given them that one yeah. pound. <laughs> okay, this episode is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com. Entroware sells computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate pre-installed. 
They have a range of desktops, laptops, and servers, and most parts are configurable so you can pick the CPU, RAM, and storage that's right for you. Check out the new revision of their 14-inch Apollo laptop. It has the latest Intel mobile processors with XE graphics, a larger battery, larger touchpad, Thunderbolt 4, and NVMe storage by default. And keep an eye out for more machines coming soon. And if you can't find exactly what you want, get in contact with them and they'll work with you on a bespoke machine for your needs. They ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, there's a little drop down at checkout where you can select late night Linux so they'll know that we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. All right, let's do a quick KDE corner before we get out of here. And the first one... You put this in. <laughs> yes, I did. Trinity Desktop R14.0.10 has been released. This is a fork of KDE 3.5, is it? From the good old days before the horrible change to 4 and then 5. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, fair play to them that they keep it going. And for people, apparently, who like this, they can keep it relevant. But, like, when does it end? <laughs> How many versions of KD ahead will they decide that, you know what, we could move this to a new version now? Or will it never end? No, they like the 3.5 and they wanted to stay on it, much like Mate stuck on the GNOME 2 paradigm. Yeah, it just looks so dated now, though. Jesus. <laughs> 26th of August, 2008. That's when 3.5.10 was released. 13 years ago. All right, uh, the next one, KDE Connect's Android app gets a mini makeover, according to Joey at OMG. I didn't really notice the difference, but then I haven't been using it since I moved off KDE. Oh, have you gotten a new version then? Because I don't. I don't have the new version yet. Uh, I think so. I don't know. Maybe I haven't. Maybe that's why it didn't look any different to me. Yeah, yeah I think that might be the case, because f well, unless you're using something else, but f definitely doesn't have uh, one that... 17 yet only has 1.16 but yeah maybe maybe the play is slightly ahead of it i'm not sure it definitely looks good though and um yeah it's good to see that they keep working on it and clean it up i mean the interface does look a bit sparse when you use it on a on a phone and um, there doesn't appear to be a lot you can do with it but they've got some great stuff coming in things like the signal strength stuff uh the audios b- being able to switch audio channel uh, and to extract MMS. I mean, I don't know who is sending MMS attachments anymore these days, but apparently that's a thing. But it's also been able to act as a basic mouse receiver as well. So that's kind of cool. And uh, Kaden Live subtitle STT, what's this? Speech to text. So this is using the VOSC engine, which can convert uh, speech to text. And they're using it as a basic subtitle system, which I think is pretty cool. I mean, I don't know how accurate it is. Uh, I've not seen any statistics on how well it works. Mm. But um, I think it's still, it's it's quite good. Well, if you're listening to this on YouTube, which a surprising number of people do, turn on the automatic subtitles and see how well Google does. So, Is that how it does it? It's not using Vosk, surely. Yeah, it's using Google's even fancier one. Ah, yeah, but the, Google's shite. Don't use Google. <laughs> right, yeah, this is going to be better than Google. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but they, they have been working on things, the zoom bars to help with the interface, trying to pan around inside the projects. And there's also effect zones, so you can apply different effects to various sections of either a track or a timeline. Um, now, I have tried to use Cadian Live in the past, very unsuccessfully but um they have also been working on some of the documentation for this as well so maybe maybe with a bit of concerted effort on that they can even help people like myself um but one thing that i thought was quite cool was there's the new online resources plugin and that adds attribution to the various sources so if you're using creative commons you know the various versions of that uh, it adds it to your project files so it's quite good for keeping track of what you've used in there to make sure that you don't use something that you shouldn't mm, sounds cool right well we better get out of here then we'll be back next week when we'll be covering some of your feedback and looking at endless os so until then i've been joe i've been Phelan. i've been graham and i've been will see you later